life that you've called us to live. <clears throat> so we commit this time into your hands, Lord. As always, we don't want to hear words of men or anyone's uh, opinion or philosophy. Lord, we want to hear uh, words of Scripture empowered by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to hear from you this morning. Speak to your children. Lord, may your word be as bread to each one, we pray, Father. In Jesus' holy name, we pray. <clears throat> I think I might move this aside. Okay, this morning's message is entitled, Now and Not Yet. Or we could say, Already, Not Yet. Now, you might have come across that phrase before in your readings. I know I have. I've heard it many, many times. Now, not yet. That's the theme, the title for the message this morning. So first question, is it scriptural? Is it scriptural? And my answer to that is yes. And we can see it right through the whole Bible. In fact, let me just quote from a well-known theologian and uh, theologian and Bible scholar. Quote, <coughs> quote or paraphrase this person. It says, eschatology... That is the study of the, the end times or, or the last days. Of course, we are living in the last days. But the, the eschaton is the last day. And eschatology is the study of, of the last, the end time. So anyway, this person says, eschatology is the key to understanding the entire Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, the heart of things is the eschatological nature and structure of the entire Bible. We see that a forward-looking element is the key to the Scriptures. A forward-looking element. The Scriptures are always pointing to something. There's a goal to which Scripture is moving. Now, the age which is to come is already here. But it is not yet here in the fullest sense. The world to come has arrived, partially, but there is more to come. The new creation has broken into human history. And when, when we studied the uh, Gospel of Mark, when we opened that book to study it together, the, one of the first things we read is Jesus' words saying, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, therefore, and believe the Gospel. He said, The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God has broken into human history, but we still pray, as the Lord taught us to pray, Lord, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. So yes, it is scriptural. Already, not yet. The second, second question is, if, if it is scriptural, does it resonate within our hearts as a true word, a true statement? And I'm going to say again yes to that, because which one of us has not experienced the truth of this statement? Now, we know that we have received something now that we have something now, something very special, something so great, so wonderful, causing us, as we were doing this morning in our worship time, to, to give expression with awe and wonder at God and to say in our hearts, what love is this that we have received now? We have received this great salvation. If you have repented and put your faith in the Lord Jesus and you belong to him through the gospel, through the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the giving of His Holy Spirit to always be with us, we receive these things now. And yet, we wait for that which is to come. We wait for the return of the Lord Jesus. We wait for the, for the culmination of God's plan to which everything is moving. Everything is moving in the, in the direction of God's plan, and it will, it will be reached. We wait for the kingdom to fully come, that everlasting kingdom of our God and of His Christ. We are looking for the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. You know, think about that. It's, it's impossible for us to imagine, isn't it, a, a new world 
wherein dwells righteousness, where righteousness is very much at home, where righteousness lives in this new world. Why, can't, why do we have such a hard time imagining that? Because we live in a world which is unrighteous, where unrighteousness dwells. And, and it's all, all around us. We, we're permeated by this uh, environment which is unrighteous, which is ungodly, which is unholy. But we look. We look to the new heavens and the new earth for that which is yet to come. Also, this statement, which, I, which we're dwelling on now, not yet, links us to two very important words in the Scriptures. Those two words are wait and hope. And how well they go together because we wait in hope. We wait in hope. Now, I want to ask you, when was there ever been a time when God's people have not been waiting? Just think back in the, in the Scriptures. God's people have always been called on to wait. You know, that very thing which we find so hard to do. We become so very impatient. But this is a very important word in Scripture to wait, both individually and corporately. Abraham waited and waited many years for the fulfillment of that promise to him. The patriarchs waited. Moses waited a long time. The prophets waited. Israel, the people of God, waited throughout the centuries for Messiah. And we wait. We wait. We wait in hope, in anticipation of that which is to come. And just by the way, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but wait is one of those five W's. <clears throat> Do you remember the five W's? Let's just uh, have a little revision lesson. Some time ago, I can't remember when, but I just gave some messages revolving around those five W's. And really, it was for me a way to just get a handle on uh, the church. In other words, if somebody says to you, well, what, what are you on about as a church? What is your thing? You know, there's a lot of people out there doing a lot of things at the moment. Some of them are playing Pokemon Go. They're going for walks with a dog. They're reading the morning papers. They're doing. They're watching the telly or a movie. They're doing. There's, there's a lot of things that people are doing. What is our thing as a church? And, and to me, I, I fall back on these five W's. It doesn't say everything, but it's just a way for me to remember what we're on about as a church. Number one, wor first one is worship. That ha that must be number one. Our thing is to worship the living God, worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's the first W. Worship. The second one is witness. And that doesn't just mean going out in the street as we uh, do from time to time to pass out tracts. Witness is something we do everywhere. Every day we witness for the Lord uh, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, among our family members. Wherever we are, we are to witness with our lives and with our words as God opens up doors of opportunity to, to speak about the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We witness with our lives. We witness with our words. That's the second W. The third one is work. Every one of us are called to work for the Lord. That is serving, serving Him, serving one another. And part of the W work is laboring in, this, in the Word, studying the Word, uh, laboring, studying, studying and reading it every day, studying yourself to be uh, approved uh, as a workman of God who does not need to be ashamed. That's the next W. After that is watch, which really is watch and pray. Watch and pray, always. And the last W is wait. Wait. And that's more of our focus right now. Now, this statement, now and not yet, also causes us to address one of the most important questions that people have asked. And that is, <clears throat> how should we then live? There was a book some years ago by that title, I believe, by Francis Schaeffer. How should we then live? That is, in this tension that exists between the now and the not yet, how should we live? Or as the Apostle Peter put it, what sort of people ought you to be? That's what he said in his letter. What sort of people ought you to be? As a people who are looking for the day to come, as a people who are waiting and waiting in hope, I just want to look at three passages, passages of Scripture on this theme. The first one is 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> 
behold or see, that which means all of us, behold, all of us see, behold, how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared, or it has not appeared as yet, what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as He is pure. Now, there's a, a great deal in, this, in these three verses of Scripture. So much can be said, but I just want to focus on our theme for this morning, now and not yet. You can see that embedded here in these verses, if you look. <clears throat> because we can see that Now, what? We are children of God. And just pause for a moment just to think of the wonder of God's grace that we should be called His children. Born again of the Spirit, in, adopted into God's family. You know, think there's about 7 billion people walking on this earth right now. How is it, could, what grace, what love is this that that's been bestowed upon us. What grace lavished that we should be called the children of God. You know, John is really saying stop and think and, and wonder and stand in awe. That is what we are now, children of God, born of Him. But what about the not yet? Well, have a look at it. It says, it has not yet appeared what we will be. There it is. There's the now and there's the not yet. It's not yet a appeared what we will be. It goes on to say that the world doesn't know us, so, so don't be surprised if, you know, f friends and even family scratch your head and, and, and don't just seem to get you or understand you or what you, you know, they don't. They won't. Don't, don't expect them to understand when you're coming from, when you say you love Jesus, when you want to worship Him, when you want to fellowship with His people, when you want to go talk to people on the street about Him. They, they will say, or when you want to go serve the Lord in another country. They don't know because they don't know Him. The next verse of Scripture I want to look at is in Colossians chapter 3. So we looked at 1 John 3, now let's go to Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> And I'll read uh, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Now, you have been, notice, it doesn't say you will be, you have been raised up with Christ. What is the not yet? It says, when when Christ, who is our life, is revealed. You see, see, Jesus has been revealed, hasn't he, to, to a certain extent. But the, we, nevertheless, we wait for the full unveiling, the manifestation, the, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says when that happens, when he is revealed, then you also will be, will be revealed with him in glory might be good to compare the two passages that we've looked at. <clears throat> One John talked about, we are now children of God. This is what we are. It has not yet appeared, hasn't been made known, fully known, manifest what we will be. And then it goes on to say, but, but, but when He comes, uh, we, 
we will be like him, for we will see him as he is, face to face. We will see the glory of the Lord Jesus. And we will be so changed that we'll have eyes to see him as he is and we will be like him. And anyone who has that hope purifies himself. And now in this Colossians, it says, when Christ is revealed, so also you will be revealed with him in glory. Now just note this. His his revelation is our revealing. Now there's the revelation of of himself, the Lord Jesus, is the revelation of us as well. His manifestation is our manifestation. Now, okay, we're just jumping back and forth. Now, not yet. Now, our life is hidden with Christ in God. Where, where is our life? Where, where, can you, where can you find it? You know, people are trying to find themselves these days and their meaning of life and purpose of life and their potential. Brothers and sisters, our life is hidden. It's hidden with Christ in God. Let's just do a look at a par- parallel passage over there in Ephesians, a couple of books before that. Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse 6. <clears throat> Ephesians, Ephesians 2, verse 6 says this, and well, maybe I should go back. Back to four to so get the whole sentence, really. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Verse 6. And raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And just, just stop for a moment. <clears throat> And just think about this, that we are actually in heaven now. We are in heaven now. So you all think, so this is what heaven's like. Yeah, not bad. We always think, what's heaven like? Well... We're, we're in heaven now, so look around you. Well, <clears throat> we are. We are in heaven now. And yet, we, we are, we're not fully there yet, are we? But I want to say, that, I want to say this. Heaven is where Jesus is. What makes heaven heaven but the Lord Jesus Christ himself? Wherever he is, that's heaven. Do we believe he's been here with us in our midst as we've been worshiping him, pouring our hearts out to him, remembering his death as we break bread together, hearing our brother speak about the need for repentance and forgiveness and receiving? Does the Lord Jesus been in our midst? We're in heaven now. As we've been worshiping the Lord together, and there's, a un- there's been a unity among us, a sharing together, a fellowship. Are we in heaven now? Yes. Are we fully there? Is there yet more to come? Yes, yes, yes. The last passage I want to look at is uh, Romans chapter 8. So we had 1 John 3. You can refer to these verses again later. Uh, Colossians 3, now Romans chapter 8. has to be one of the greatest chapters in all of Scripture, Romans chapter 8. And I'm just going to be reading now. It, it, actually, verses um, 24 and 25 speak of these two key words, wait and hope. Hoping and eagerly waiting. But I just want to go back and start with verse 18. So I'm going to be reading Romans 8, verses 18 to 24. Verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. 
For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. The whole creation groans. Can you hear? Can you hear creation groaning? Yes, every single day. But what does the apostle go on to say? That's that's all creation, but as far as us, we just kick back in the shade and drink lemonade. Well, let's, let's continue reading. I'm up to verse 23. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. All of creation is groaning. We ourselves, so deep within ourselves, there's a groaning within us. As we, as we are in this time of waiting, waiting eagerly, eagerly it says. <clears throat> now let's read uh, the last two verses there. Verse 24. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he, for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Now, <clears throat> have, have you not, did you notice in that passage that uh, waiting eagerly was uh, repeated three times? Either eagerly waiting or waiting eagerly. eagerly. Three times. Um, verse 19, you see it? Creation waits eagerly. You see it in verse 23. Not only this, but we ourselves groan within ourselves as we waiting eagerly. And verse 25, you see it again three times, waiting eagerly. There it, there it is. But <clears throat> what about the now? Now, now is suffering. Now is a time of suffering. That's what he says. I consider that the sufferings of this present time, that means the, the now, and, and the, the, the now is, is marked not only, solely, but to a large degree by suffering. And we should not be surprised. Think of Jesus' own words to his apostles before he died. He said, in the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. He, he's, he's not uh, trying to uh, soften things for his disciples in any way. He said, in the world you will have tribulation. But then he says, I want to let you in on a secret. Take courage. I have overcome the world. And, and we also should not be surprised because, uh, you know, one of the disciples that heard Jesus say those words was Peter. And later on, Peter wrote this. Peter himself wrote, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. He said, do not, do not be surprised. Some people, I think, are, pre are presented with the gospel in such a way that y you know what I'm talking about. You know, there's the, there's the uh, health and wealth and prosperity gospel and, uh, you know, come to Jesus and he'll make your good life even better and it's going to be wonderful. And, and, th and then something happens and they say, whoa, I didn't sign up for this. Nobody told me about this. Nobody told me I was going to lose my friends and I was going to be made fun of and ridiculed and have all these hardships and this happened and that happened. Don't be surprised, Peter says, <clears throat> this fiery ordeal. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may also rejoice with exultation. That's 1 Peter chapter 4. Now, Suffering, tribulation, hardship, trial, testing. But what, 
But what is yet to come? The glory. The glory that is to be revealed. Now, what, what is it that we're waiting for? According to this passage, that what we're waiting for are, are, are revealing to take place. First and for, foremost, we're waiting for the Lord Jesus' return and for the revelation of His glory. <clears throat> but as I said before, this, this is when the sons of God, the children of God, the sons and daughters of God will be revealed as well. And this is what all creation looks for and is, and is groaning and waiting in anticipation for, the revelation of the, of the sons of God. When will this happen? When Christ is revealed. And then the children of God. Remember what we read in 1 John. We, we are the children of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. So the not yet aspect causes this groaning within ourselves. Notice, notice the, uh, both things happening in the heart of the believer, the rejoicing and the groaning. They're not mutually exclusive. There's sorrow and there's rejoicing together. And we've all experienced that. I think we all know. That. Certainly the Apostle Paul experienced together within his own heart. And he had a big heart, the Apostle Paul. But he had tremendous rejoicing in here. And he had tremendous sorrow at the same time. Now and not yet. We hope for what we do not see. That's what the, that's what the Bible here tells us. You know, <clears throat> we're, saved, we're saved in hope. But then Paul just says, look, who, who hopes for what he already sees? If, you've got, if, I'm, if I'm hoping for something given to me and I have it right there in my hand, there might be a lot of things that I do. I might be very thankful. I might use whatever it is, but I'm not going to hope for it any longer if I have it there in front of my eyes. But if... if if I don't see it, I'm going to wait for it. We, we hope for what we do not see. With perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Well, let me just summarize and just make a few apl applications of this, of this message. <clears throat> how, does, how does this apply to our lives day in and day out as we get up tomorrow, Monday morning, and go to work or get the kids ready to go to school, make our plans for this and that? Well, one thing to me that stands clear, that we always, always, always live in hope. We live in hope for that which is to come. And we live in joy. There, there's a rejoicing. And it, there's, a, there's a present, there's a rejoicing because of what we have now. And there's a rejoicing of what we will have. The glory that's yet to be revealed. Joy now, joy then. In fact, it even kind of works backwards. Because there's going to be joy then, that's why there's joy now. Because we are saved then, and that's sure, guaranteed by the Word of God, because He has, he has made us His children. He has adopted us into His family. God has eyes upon you as His dear child. And He's not going to withdraw that love which He's given, which He's bestowed upon you. And we, we will be saved. And because we will be saved, we're saved now. And because there is such this glorious future that's in front of us, that we, we are looking for it. We are looking for it. We're waiting for it. We're waiting for it. We have joy now, even in the midst of whatever suffering and trial may be our lot at the moment. Present enjoyment and joyful anticipation. Well, how should we then live? That question. Well, to put it in one word, we should live differently, differently than all the rest of the world who, who don't have this hope who don't have that forgiveness that we, we heard about, who, don't, who not, don't have that assurance of salvation, that blessed assurance, who don't know that their sins have been washed and they can call God the Heavenly Father and they can, can look forward to one day seeing Jesus face to face. If, if, if we have that and others don't, then we should live differently. We should live in holiness and in godliness. There should be an otherworldly aspect to our lives an otherworldly aspect to our lives. You see, our citizenship is in heaven. 
Yes, our feet are planted here on this earth, and for us at the moment, it happens to be the country of Australia. Thank God for that, and we can, we can be very thankful that we're living in this country. But our citizenship is in heaven. We have a different worldview. We have a different mindset. What does it say in Colossians? Set your mind. Mindset. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Are we only ever talking ceaselessly about the things of, of this earth? Monitor perhaps your conversation as you go through the week. And how much of it is only the things to do with this world? Your thoughts and your words and actions. Is it only for the here and now? Well, we better repent, brothers and sisters, because we are to set our minds on things above. Not on the things that are on the earth. Just flip back to Colossians 3 for just a second. And let's... Um, Read a little bit further. <clears throat> Set your mind on things above and not on the things on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Our lives should be marked by holiness and godliness. However much we, we feel that we fall short of those things, this is, this is what our life is to be, different, holy, set apart for the Lord. There should be a family likeness to our Father in heaven. You know that saying, like father, like son? My poor son is forever being told, oh, you look like your dad, uh, the, the, the poor guy. But <clears throat> never mind, there should be a family likeness. And, and we, are, we are now being conformed to the image of his beloved son. Our lives should be marked by obedience to his will, working and humbly serving God and others for his glory and for the edification of the brothers and sisters, and we should be faithful until the end. So our lives should be marked by obedience, service, faithfulness. I want to let Peter have the last word. <clears throat> so I, w I would like to turn to, to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verses 8 to 18. I read this passage and then I close in prayer. I read this passage in the hope that for all of us these words will sink deeply into our hearts. And then I close in prayer. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 18. <clears throat> but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will, be, will melt with intense heat? But according to His promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, as just also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. Oh, let, let me finish. Uh, uh, as also in all his letters, speaking to them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, 
which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of scriptures, to their own destruction. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.